Hello and welcome to Matcha Mornings, part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network. I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith, and I'm excited to dive deep on topics around holistic health, the power of food, hormone health, how the practices of yoga can impact our health and well-being, and much more. So grab your cup of tea, settle in, and let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Matcha Mornings podcast. I am very excited to be back here today with part two of my podcast episode with Nicole and Carrie from Resolve Pain Guru. If you haven't listened to part one, I would definitely recommend going back to the last episode and checking it out. You'll get to hear a little bit more about their background, the method that they teach, and a bit around the mind-body connection. And in this episode, we're diving right into things. We're diving into the pain body, what is chronic pain? How does mental pain lead to physical pain? And ultimately the solution to all of this. So we are covering a ton in this episode. We're going deep on pain, how the brain and body works together. And I learned so much from Carrie and Nicole. So I hope that you find this informative too. And hopefully if you are somebody who's living with pain or chronic pain, that you find this helps you take the first step towards healing. All right, let's get into the episode with Carrie and Nicole. Carrie, Nicole, welcome back to the podcast today. I'm really excited to have you here with me. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. Yeah, we're looking forward to having another chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. Me as well. So for anyone listening, if you haven't listened to part one of the show, I would definitely recommend going back, checking that out. You can hear all about Carrie and Nicole's background, how they came to be working together and their method of teaching. And we talk a little bit also about the mind-body connection and... I think we're going to kick things off today with the pain body and talking a bit about chronic pain. And this is kind of where a lot of my knowledge, I think, sort of stops. I'm a 500-hour registered yoga teacher, and this isn't really stuff we get into in yoga teacher training. We kind of sort of teachers are taught or yoga teachers specifically are taught that when it comes to pain, we can't fix pain. And I think a lot of people are living with pain and in chronic pain. So I'd love to dive into a little bit about what the pain body is, what chronic pain is, and then go from there. Great. I'll start. I'm Nicole. Um, Let's let's talk a little bit about um, pain, just so we have a a general understanding. Body's way of saying, you know, please give me some attention. You know, Um, things are are not working well. There's something not quite right. I need some help. And it's typically we, we tend to ignore that. And we, we tend to instead push through life and then we push through our busy schedules and we push through exercise. And that's obviously not a solution because the pain then becomes chronic. And what we mean by chronic pain is that that pain has been around for about six months with no marked improvement. So an example would be, you know, you twist your ankle and that ankle is swollen and sore and you ice it and you get, you know, go to physio and all those different things. And then it starts to get better and the swelling goes down and it starts to move better and then you feel better. But what if that, pain persisted and then you but you actually have no swollen anything anymore there's no injury anywhere well then that the question becomes you know where's the pain and then that's how we kind of classify it as chronic because at that point the pain is actually originating from the brain and not from the from the tissues the soft tissues themselves in terms of them being damaged and so we tend to you know look for some sort of temporary relief and we will do certain things like go see someone or what have you, but we are, we tend to, when we do look for relief, we tend to look for that relief outside of ourselves. And so we'll get a little something because my back went out or, you know, my, um, my ankle's still hurting, but then there's still no progression into wellness. And so then we have to, then, then comes the acceptance of, well, this is just, this is just me. This is just how I live. This is, you know, it's part of my life now, you know, my back pain, my, ankle that I I sprained last year, you know, it's never going to be better. And this is just how I'm going to be. And then society says, well, you know what, you can seek solutions outside, or you can ignore it. And after that, we don't really have a whole lot. And what happens is when someone has been in pain for a really long time, that pain and that tension inhibits the flow of energy in the body and everything takes more effort mentally, emotionally, and physically, because it's exhausting absolutely exhausting to be in pain and of course when you're in pain of any kind you're it's going to interrupt your sleep so then you're losing that sleep quality and again you're in this deficit all the time and part of the part of why we get into pain is because we have been um 
as, as we get, as the body gets older, as we get older, we tend to move less and less. If you think about children, they run, they jump, they roll, they hang upside down on the monkey bars, right? And as we get older, we move less and less and less and less and our movements become more repetitive and habituated movement becomes, can be, can start to become problematic. And this is really telling because we, we habituate into movement, but that habituation is also happening sort of on a mental, emotional, spiritual level as well. But speaking just in terms of physical habituation, think about something so simple as you get up in the morning and you go to the bathroom and you grab your toothbrush, you toothbrush in your right hand, toothpaste in the left, and you put the toothpaste on from, from the front of the toothpaste to the back of the to- uh, toothbrush to the back. And then you start to brush the left side of your mouth. Well, that's a habituated pattern. It's unconscious and it's something that's happening in the past. There's no presence in that action. And it's this lack of presence that, that, that we start, that starts to become a problem. And the yogis, um, anybody that's, that's done, uh, studied yoga will probably know about the word samskara. And what mm-hmm. samskara means is impression. And so if we have had impressions in our life, um, so think about, past or current life experiences, uh, we collect memories and impressions, and then we store them in our bodies and in our energy fields. And these stored impressions can be, they can be positive or negative, but they create a filter through which we, we process absolutely everything. So they, that filter can be something not so great that, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm my, my, my body. I don't like my body, you know, different things like that. And so we, and we recollect these impressions all the time. And these impressions inform our thoughts and our beliefs and our actions. And then we go ahead and we get attached to all these beliefs and likes and dislikes. And this holds us back from, and keep, and keeps us very trapped in this repetition. And interestingly, this is what the yogis refer to as um, the kleshas, right? This path to suffering, because we attach, we forget who we are. We attach to our likes and our dislikes. Uh, We resist change. And there's one other, which I can't remember right now. And so we have to kind of begin to, when pain is present in the body, we have to begin to consider some scara and, and the glaciers and how are all those things affecting, sorry, clients will come forward with, with things like, you know, always needing to be liked, or they get defensive, they're criticized, or um, they like to judge or judge, judge others, they eat to soothe themselves, right? These are all behaviors that are created by a past collection of memories and impressions and experiences. And then they present as pain in the body. And the body says, come on, give me some attention because I can't function this way anymore. We're we're not living a life on purpose anymore. And that's where pain kind of pushes through into the physical body at that point. I'd I'd love to just tell a very short little story Um, um, with a a new client I've just started working with. We've only had, so it was a client I'd seen about a year and a half ago. Uh, I've only had one session, actually, a private session um, since uh, starting to work together again. And this individual has experienced a significant amount of trauma and um, as a child um, did not have the support that this person needed from uh, the parental bodies and had a fairly um, difficult past um, and is identifies as a very, very hard worker, very tall, um, strong um, individual into martial arts. And over the past year um, has been suffering from um, considerable chronic pain and what the medical system would diagnose as a carpal tunnel or just a lot of chronic tightness in the forearms to the point where this person who has a very physical uh, job is unable now to actually like pick up a hammer or shovel, um, has a young child who desperately wants to hold the child and finds that the arms get so fatigued that this person can't hold the child. This client is working through, um, working with another uh, therapist, another clinician, like a counselor, um, and starting and understanding. So this is clients come to me now and understanding that, you know, some of these samskaras, some of these past experiences are informing what's showing up now. So that's a beautiful thing because as this client comes in the doorway, you know, it means that some of this, this explanation about the mind-body connection there's already an understanding. You know what? I understand that some of what's happened to me is now showing up as this. And this person is trying to understand it, right? 
So when we look at a body and we understand the samskaras, that's one aspect of working with pain or persistent pain. But then there's also this, this understanding of how that those samskaras show up in the physical form. And there's some, some reflexes. And I probably won't get into the reflex necessarily, but let's just talk about one of the reflexes that's, that's called our freeze reflex, right? It's like fight, flight, or freeze. And freeze is, is how we kind of, how our shoulders kind of come forward, how our chest and our heart gets tight, how our rib cage sinks downwards. And we might notice it as like the lazy boy posture, you know, like if, if you think about sitting in a lazy boy chair and how the shoulders round forward and everything in the front body gets contracted. Um, but it, it works really deep, right? It's really deep in the nervous system, this ingrained pattern of how those muscles get short and tight. And so we had this session last week and we were just starting to, we had talked about the samskara piece and we had talked about, you know, how some of these experiences are now showing up for whatever reason. and what was interesting is that we started to do some work. We started to do some movement that was addressing that reflex in the front of the body that was addressing the muscles in the chest that was addressing the breathing that was just addressing the belly and where the arms have been feeling like numb and not alive and unable to grip and what have you, as we were doing this work in the trunk of the body, this, this person says to me, oh my God, I'm, just getting, I'm getting all this sensation down my arms and into my hands. I can't believe it. Wow. Right? Like it's just, it was profound, right? It's just like, we're starting to address, okay, so what do the hands represent? Well, the hands are what we hold on to. And this person is working through these terrible experiences uh, of being uh, not cared for. You know, it was, it was like, there, there's all this unresolved emotion, probably anger, probably frustration, let down, um, all of that. And the hands represent, you know, holding on to something, but the hands also represent what do we need to let go of? Right. We have this choice, <laughs> you know, this client has this choice. It's like, as this client is working through some of these samskaras, it's like, there is the process of letting go of the disappointment, maybe letting go of where this person wasn't nurtured or cared for. And then there's this desire to hold on to what the client now loves so dearly, the child, the, the things in life, like the sports and what have you. So this is how, you know, how this process of working privately and individually is happening as we address both the breath body, both the movement aspect, the somatic piece and the samskaras and understanding how that all weaves into showing up in the physical body. And then how this awareness of working with the mind and the body together is now starting to create some change and some release. This is really powerful. What we have also uh, observed, and I can I can attest to this in my own body, and I always say to my clients, I don't ask them to do anything I haven't done myself, and um, that I I was able to clear some scara um, that as a result of these practices that we teach, they're very very profound that way. So it's not you know we tend to think of you know of somatics as well the body the body the body the brain the muscles the brain the muscles, and and yes that's true all of that is very true. But when you bring in this deep, deep sense of being into the practice, which is what yoga brings to the table, it shifts, shifts the practice to such a level that you can actually sense and feel that samskara leaving. And I, I, have, I tend to work um, over the years with a lot of people who are intuitives. And so they can see, like I, I can kind of ed, you know, educate, take an educated guess, look at my life that yes, I've definitely let go of that one, but they could actually feel the stuck energy being shifted and released. So they were able to actually, actually get a sense of doing a particular movement and practice that I was giving them, guiding them through, and they would, they would go, whoa, I could feel that go. And that to me was proof in the pudding because that was one of many, many, many people who have said that to me over the last few years. And, and then they, they noticed a, sh a shift in how they function in their daily life and how, you know, they're not triggered the same way about something, things like that. It's very, very significant. And what I, what I like about it is it's, it's quite, it's very efficient. Like it can happen quite quickly. 
And that's what I love about the practice is that you, when you're consistent with the practice, yes, you're getting tension out of your system. Yes, you're changing these reflex patterns that Kara's are referring to. You know, yes, you're going to feel, you know, some your tension, shoulder, chronic shoulder, shoulder tension start to let go. But there's there's so much more to it as well. And that's what I love about it. And I and I think I think just to summarize, you know, both what Nicole and I have both said, it's like it's like the essence of the practices is it coming back home to ourselves. It's like understanding and recognizing our true brilliance. That is the that is really the essence of yoga, right? Is to yoke, to unite with yourself. And how are we practicing in order to do that? How are we experiencing ourselves, right? When we recognize that those samskaras are not who we are, they are just experiences. They're just layers that veil ourselves from shining in our most brilliant way, right? When we, when we start to understand that, that's where that true healing is, is happening. As Nicole is saying, it's like, wow. And the shifts are profound. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and the samskaras, as we know, they make us, they, they lead us to live in the past. So we're always working off of old data in the hard drive. And when we first work with someone, we teach them a very, 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 very important skill called interoception. And it sounds simple and it's very difficult to do and it takes practice. And all we're, all we are asking of our clients is to, is to begin to sense and feel. And that's, what interoception is and this is a skill that we we teach you know all of the time and oftentimes we'll slow a practice down to so micro minute just so that someone can begin to sense and feel and when you begin to sense and feel so let's say you do some tiny little movement you you know you roll your pelvis forward and back for example right which we call arch and flatten you do this exercise and you break this you take this exercise you do it a lot smaller than you're used to doing it and then break it down let's say another 50 percent, right like really small And then you begin to sense and feel what's allowing my pelvis to move towards my feet. What's allowing my pelvis to come back towards my head. What do I sense and feel in my body? What am I aware of? Where am I holding tension in my body? All of a sudden you're paying so much attention to what's going on in your body at the moment that you are 100% present. And that's what I was referring to in our last podcast, where I said my experience with with this was so profound. This Omi Yoga experience was so profound because it was the first time I was 100% present in a practice. And the results are phenomenal. When I became present, everything shifted. And this is the the, the real key. And it, and and interoception doesn't have to be in our work. It can be in everything. It can be in you know in a, in a regular yoga practice in your yin practice that you did. Right, sense and feel what's happening in your body, and then respond to your body. But the sensing and feeling is not about judgment. It's it's about observation. What do I sense and feel? So the eyes are closed, and you're going deep inside. It's it's a very very profound practice. Yeah, thank you so much for all of that information. And one of the things that is is really interesting to me from this conversation is how, you know, these sanskaras and and this trauma can kind of show up. So when you guys start working with someone, is one of your first questions with somebody or on your intake going to be something around getting them to connect with like past traumas or that type of thing? Or, or how do you kind of, I guess, like get somebody to start or encourage somebody to start talking about that or or feeling into like maybe the pain in my body has something to do with this like thing I experienced as a child or as an adolescence or something like that. It's not that we directly, like we are not, um, we're not counselors, right? We're not, we're not um, psychologists. So certainly I don't have a, a field on my form that says, you know, have you experienced past traumas? But what, what is more the, the way that I approach it is, is that as people fill out some health history and they and they and they list maybe some surgeries they've had or voluntarily they will disclose that you know that there might have been abuse or maybe they maybe they had a really you know bad car accident all of those things are impressions and so what's interesting is that we more um what i do with clients is that i i share this beautiful mind map model with them that gets them to understand how the mind works and gets them to understand the influence that these experiences have on on the body, on the body and the pain body. 
and I think Nicole would agree that she she um, would would maybe refer to that as well. Sometimes I'll actually bring out this laminated lovely uh, visual and I will talk to people that way. And sometimes I will say less and let them experience it through the practices as Nicole is saying, right? We, we really want to get into this experience of, of being with oneself and being in the body. And sometimes, you know, as a client comes in, we spend a longer time chatting because that's what's needed. And sometimes um, we spend a much shorter time. We go over some of the health history and then, and then we're starting to get into that place of let's really get quiet and notice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Nicole, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah. I, I, I for me, I, again, to Terry's point, I don't, I don't ask anything directly, although ultimately what ends up happening is it comes out, something comes out some way. And I'm not saying I, we need the whole story or, you know, we, we, we need the details. It's not that at all. It's just that you can see. So as they're moving, you can see something's very stuck. And we know, you know, from uh, that our different parts of our bodies represent different things. So we can sort of glean a little bit from that as the, as the practitioner. And then, and then the, or the person ha- begins to cry and says, I, I, I've had a memory of something and then they bring it up, you know, but uh, we wait for them to bring it forward. And then there are times where if I've known somebody, you know, well enough and work with them for long enough, you know, I can be quite direct because that's, you know, how people have helped me by being very direct. And so I, I appreciate that. And I would just say, are you recognized on right now? And can you, can you, and look, I can trace this back to appointment, you know, four, six, eight, or what have you. And then they'll kind of go, Oh, wow, you're right. I'd never realized I was doing that. And so we just bring forward an awareness because as we all know, right. In the world of yoga, awareness is everything, right? Once you're aware of something, it begins to shift. And so we want if they're not coming, becoming, uh, seeing that awareness right away, then I'm going to bring that forward because I think that's really important to, for them to begin to realize. And once these awarenesses start to come up, the shifts can happen really, really fast. And when there's some real, you know, solid resistance there, we're not going, we're not going there, right? We just, because it's the person's process. And, you know, I want, I want them to process through this stuff as, as best as they can in a, in a way that feels really, really safe, because if they're not safe, then we're not going to get any work done. Right. So they have to learn to become, to listen to their own bodies. And then they have to become the witness of what they sense and feel and what their thoughts are. Right. And so all of that, the slowing down is what creates this incredible opportunity. And then further to that, with with a somatic practice, what is what it happens in somatic practice is you're asked to sense and feel a contracting muscle. So to simplify, let's say I said to you, can you do a bicep curl? And instead of just whipping into that bicep curl, we say, can you sense and feel what's happening in that muscle as you contract it and as you release it? And it's very, it's not that easy to do at first. It takes a little bit of practice because oftentimes we don't have much awareness of these muscles. And so that again, even with, with in the somatic world, there is this element of being so present to what is, to what you're sensing and feeling. And this is, this is the brilliance, I think of the work. And this is, was the real game changer and how we were able to begin to begin to um, really help people to understand this, the mind body connection. Yeah. I mean, it's so powerful for somebody to be able to connect with this, you know, on their own and to be able to kind of feel into their body and recognize like what is happening and then start to use the techniques you're, you're talking about and that you work with your clients with to kind of ease that pain. Like, I don't think that anybody wants to be in pain or feel uncomfortable, or like we talked about in the last episode, like feel this strong disconnection from their body. I mean, I've gone through phases where I felt really disconnected from my body and it doesn't feel like in alignment. Like it's not something that's enjoyable to experience. It feels much better when you feel like you wake up and you feel good in your body and you feel connected to it. And, you know, you can move and and feel through it and, and that type of thing. So um, I, I love that you're doing this work. One of the things that I'm curious about is because we've talked about sort of this like physical aspect of pain and maybe this like physical trauma. So if it's like abuse or car accidents, maybe it's something like a surgery that can kind of like hold, I guess, like uh, energy in our body that can cause pain. But what about like the the mental pain? 
the mental pain that we experience? How does that connect to the physical pain we experience? So as yogis, I think we all re- know that all pain is spiritual in nature. And so we are, and we get messages coming through and then eventually that pain shows up, uh, pain, pain or dysfunction shows up in our body. Pain is often associated with anxiety, depression, high stress responses in the body. And so when we take an opportunity to, to slow that person down and to get them into that, into intercepting and sensing and feeling that too can be to shift because remember that that is the reason it's a, it's a symptom of what's happening, you know, having a life experience they've had and then how they are interpreting the world based on that. And so when we, you know, my experience, when I was anxiety or dealing with depression, when we take them through these, these practices where they're moving very slowly, where they're interocepting, so remember sensing and feeling the inner workings of the body, they feel better afterwards. And I will add this as well. And then when they, that they come off the bed and they feel better, then we put them, get them in their legs, meaning that we, we get them really grounded doing things that work the muscles of the legs that connect the feet to the ground. And they feel a shift from the beginning of practice of their session to the end of their session. And so with consistency of practice, you can begin to shift some of these samskaras that drive those behaviors or those, those, um, you know, emotional situations like depression and anxiety. And I hope that's is answering. I'm heading in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so essentially it's like kind of what the things that are like happening mentally can really impact the things that we're feeling in our bodies as well, because our bodies and our minds are very much connected. I guess would that be kind of like the short form of that? Correct. Right. Because we, we say mind, body, spirit, but we're talking about the same thing. They're all the same thing. They're one entity. Hey everyone, we're just taking a quick break from the show to talk about Energy Bits. Energy Bits are spirulina tablets made of one ingredient, algae. Nothing added, nothing subtracted, just 100% plant-based algae nutrition. No sugar, no caffeine, no gluten, no soy, no additives, no GMOs, no preservatives, no binders, nothing artificial. Just 100% algae, 100% green, 100% healthy, and 100% pure. Pure and simple, the way food should be. They have high protein, high beta carotene, high iron, high chlorophyll, high antioxidants, and over 40 plus vitamins, including the B vitamins. They have electrolytes, including magnesium, potassium, and are a great source of essential fatty acids. Honestly, I could go on and on and on about how great energy bits are for you. And that's why I've decided to partner with them. If you want to learn more about energy bits or order some yourself, you can head on over to energybits.com to learn more. Use the code WANDERBARN to get 20% off your order. Once again, that's energybits.com and use the code WANDERBARN for 20% off your order. All right, back to the episode. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if we if we did a practice where we were just balancing our breath, we were common practice, some of Riti breath, you're breathing in for four counts and out for four counts, right? So that's how you came in and you were experiencing a lot of anxiety. You had a lot of worry, a lot of busy mind. And you notice that your breath was all over the board, very erratic, or maybe braced and held. And so then you just sat down and all you did was you breathed in for four counts and you breathed out for four counts. You didn't force it. You didn't rush it. And you spent, you spent about five minutes doing that. I can almost guarantee that after that five minutes, you would notice that your mind was a little bit calmer. And you would start to notice that there was a physical response in the body, right? Might, and that and the energy shifted down. Now it's starting to shift downwards into maybe the lower parts of the body, the lower chakras into the feet. So just like a simple example of how when we offer a stimulus to one of those kosha layers that Nicole's talking about, which is our pranamaya kosha, which is our breath body, how that starts to affect our mental body. And it starts to affect our physical body. And so, so we can never separate any of those aspects of ourselves because when we are working with one of those layers, we're working with all of those layers. 
And so when we are anything that we do, whether it's a, a breath practice as Carrie just described, or it's a little tiny practice of intercepting, feeling your pelvis go rocking back and forth, you are blooping. I kind of use a water balloon example. Imagine you have a water balloon, you stick your finger in the water balloon and the water displaces to, into somewhere else, but it's still the same balloon. Well, I think of, tend to think of the kosher layers like that. We, when we do something in, with one part of us, our physical part, we are blooping into all the other parts as well. So when we have e- emotional stuff going on, anxiety and depression, when we, when we bloop into our physical body, we're affecting what's happening on the emotional level or in the mind level as well. They're not, we can't separate these things. So every practice we do has an effect on all levels. I would like to share a story, a really amazing, amazing story. Person comes in and they are dealing with this tremendous amount of pain in the leg, hips, back. And this has been going on for a really long time. And at the same time, they were in uh, an abusive situation and um, had a court date coming up and all the things that go along with, you know, being a parent and with an abusive partner in the court. And we, um, we, 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 she was very diligent about doing all the practices that we, I recommended. And we talked a lot about all these elements that we're now discussing here today. And, um, and over um, a six, about, I think it was about a 12 week period, she transformed to quite an amazing level. And she ended up going to court eventually. And after she went to court, she called me back and she said, you're not going to believe this. She says, I was felt so empowered and I was so strong and I was so centered and I don't have any pain at all, even though I've been through all the stress of having to get ready for court and then go into court. Cause I hadn't seen her for quite some time. Right. She says, I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe it. I feel amazing. And I want to just calling back to say, thank you. And what this is addressing is this question of the, the koshas. We were working with her physical body to try and help with her pain and she was using the skill of interoception to enter in her practices. And she, what happened was she blooped into her whole life, all the whole, her whole being. And she was able to shift out of the belief systems that she was not good enough for, that she was, had no power and transform that into feeling powerful and having her voice. And all of that came and she will, would attribute this to tell you this, that it all came out of these practices. And it was such a beautiful story. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I I just find it like so interesting to think about just the the interconnectedness of it all. I think that's one thing that's really fascinated me through my entire yoga and my own personal spiritual journey and something that I really connected with when I did my first yoga teacher training was just how, you know, it's like you know, like you said, we can't just work on mental health one day and work on physical health the other day. They're all interconnected. Every day is mental health and physical health day. And, you know, working on one isn't separate from the other one. All these things are connected. And it took me a long time to kind of like understand that and then start to integrate that in my own life. And I'm curious if we can talk about for people listening who, really want to start diving a little bit more into this, you know, where do you start with handling pain, handling trauma, um, starting to, to integrate some of these, these practices of slowing down, just taking care of ourselves more and all that type of thing. I guess, what is, what is the solution? (laughs) Well, the first, this is Carrie here that, um, you know, the first thing that that we invite everyone to do is to determine if your pain is acute or chronic. So if it's something that's just happened recently, then hopefully um, giving it some time, you know, a month or two or three, if that's an injury, you know, that's going to heal and everything's good. (laughs) Um, But if, if pain's been there for a while and it's chronic um, then you want to be starting to inform yourself, educate yourself and start, start to explore getting into your own body, getting into some of these practices. Um, if you have chronic pain, if you're used to stretching and you're used to forcing in your body, then we highly recommend that you stop doing that because all that does is it stresses out your nervous system a little bit more and, um, 
And it's, you know, it, when we stretch and we, we force into our muscles, we, it's very difficult to listen to the messages that are coming back from the body. Um, we also want people to avoid moving in pain. So that's difficult when pain persists. Um, but, you know, we want to let go of this idea that no pain, no gain, right? There's, there's certainly that saying persists and, um, you know, sometimes we come across practitioners or therapists, someone or, or, or professionals that hold power over us. And they say, you know what, you just got to move through it. You just got to move through it. And um, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do. We want to be listening to the messages that are coming from the body and from the brain. Um, and then, and then, as I mentioned, I think it was probably in the first um, podcast, we encourage everyone to start building a daily soma yoga practice or somatics practice. And the very first practice that, oh my God, can benefit everybody. Everybody doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how old you are, would be to start to explore that, that practice that we've referred to a few times called arch and flatten. So we have that as a video on our YouTube channel, which you can access. Um, and then we also have some other videos that are available on our YouTube channel. So if you know that you're suffering and you have pain, then starting to work with the breath daily. So starting to get quiet and listen, we have a practice on our you screen channel, a few of them that, um, are wonderful. They're under the category of free videos. So we've got one that's a guide, a meta guided meditation. Um, that's about six minutes long and it helps you start to develop those interoception skills. Um, there is a practice called breathe with me. These are all really short practices, right? So you're just taking a little bit of time out of your day to start to pay attention. The breathe with me practice is about eight minutes long. And again, we talked about how the nervous system gets sensitized when we're in pain. So when we breathe consciously and slow down, we're starting to shift that nervous system response into a parasympathetic state. There's a body scan to help you fall asleep. So I'm just kind of listing some of the resources um, because Nicole and I feel very strongly that we want people to access these resources um, and not feel like, um, you know, you necessarily have to pay a lot of money to get yourself started and just notice how powerful these practices are. Nicole. I also like to mention that um, that we have um, we we teach a pain relief series. So I'm doing a pain relief series uh, right now. It's a four week series. So it's for folks who are have pain in their bodies and they're ready to get started. And it it guides them through the whole uh, the, the these a lot of these principles that we've just talked about and practices. And I was just again story time. I had a I'm teaching a series right now on it's all online. And we first practice we did was arch and flatten. And somebody emailed me a few days later and said, um, an older person and said, you know, this is, uh, this is amazing. I've had, I haven't been able to go up and down the stairs without tremendous knee pain for 15 years. And I, for the first time ever, I don't have any knee pain. That's how powerful the practices can be. So you, going back to Carrie's point, a simple, a simple arch and flatten exercise, which is available on our YouTube channel is a great way to start. However, we do have, you know, a series coming up. We've got a, a workshop coming up soon about uh, call, about what is sensory motor amnesia. So understanding how the brain and the nervous system and muscles and how it all works. So we've, we're trying to put out more and more and more um, educational pe uh, uh, pieces out as often as we possibly can. Um, just so that you folks can get started because getting out of pain, I mean, you can, even if you're not going to get out hundred percent, what we're, what we're teaching can get you out 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. It just, it's any percentage is better than, than continuing to stay in, 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 in pain. Yeah, absolutely. I really love that. And I mentioned this in the last episode we did together, but I love how your recommendations start with just doing something every day and something small. And I'm curious if you have any tips for kind of, you know, the the busy people out there. And that includes myself, you know, 
we are so busy these days. There's so much going on. And I think a lot of people have good intentions of starting these types of practices or taking care of themselves and that type of thing, especially, you know, being relatively new into 2021, we're into a new year. Lots of people have good intentions, yet it's easy to not do the things that we want to do, or maybe start do that, starting to do them and then falling off. Do you guys have any tips for how to actually, you know, start these practices and sticky and stick to it? Yeah, for um, what we're doing is we're making things really super short. So for example, an arch and flatten practice can be five, under five minutes. And a lot of other things we're doing are really super short so that you can find some at least some time to do it. And um, what we recommend is, um, is actually trying to do stuff before bed if you're a person that has pain. Um, if you can do, instead of, you know, watching that last TV program for half an hour, can you just go to your room instead and, and lay on your bed or on the floor um, and just do some movement? Or alternatively, before you get up in the morning, when you do that morning stretch, um, can you do that morning stretch? And can you do arch and flatten and a couple of other exercises that we recommend? And you will be amazed at how that little five, 10 minutes can make a tremendous difference in if at night, the quality of your sleep or in the day, how you feel moving around. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. That's uh, if my morning routine has become pretty sacred to me these days. Nothing interrupts it. Almost nothing interrupts it. And um, I feel so much better by actually sticking to it. It did take a long time to get into that, but I find even moving for like 10, 15, 20 minutes just starts my day off on such a better foot than if I just jump out of bed and hop right on my computer. Yeah. And, and the thing is, man, if you're, if you're a person with a body in pain, right, which is our, you know, basically everybody we deal with, you probably already are not that great with, uh, with that level of discipline. And so that's why, you know, we recommend starting with something small, because as I, as I short share with that example before, you'll get results. And then when you get those little results, that's the, that's the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That's the, the sugar, that's the, you know, the icing that on the cake that motivates you to keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the thing that'll keep you coming back for sure. I can definitely relate to that. Right. I actually have a friend who right. just recently has made it some really great changes to his lifestyle. He's lost, you know, about 40 pounds and 40 pounds of probably like, you know, pure belly fat that needed to come off of him based on his stature and stuff like that. And he's like, during the pandemic, he was, you know, eating really healthy. He was, um, eating pretty low carb and a lot of vegetables. He was exercising, you know, throughout the day, which was something he didn't do before. And he was sleeping well, he wasn't drinking alcohol. And he's like, I just thought everyone felt like crappy all the time. Cause that's what I felt like. Look, I didn't even realize I could feel like this. I didn't know that it was an option. And that's something I can relate to from a different time in my life, you know, maybe 10 or so years ago, having a lot of issues with my stomach, having imbalanced hormones. I was in college. So I was drinking a lot of alcohol. I wasn't eating super healthy and making those changes. It's like, you kind of can't, or it's harder to go back once you like feel how good you can potentially feel. And I think that's the thing we need, right? When we're used to feeling in pain or not good in our bodies all the time, we kind of have to get that like that hit of goodness to, to want that again and again. That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it, 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 it does take consistency. I mean, we're all, we're all human, right? So we, we falter some days and we get distracted some days, but um, ultimately, you know, as Nicole and I've explained, I mean, the practices are just so simple and when they're so simple and you see results right away, then it's like, ah, oh, I can do that. I can totally do that. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Is there anything else other of you would like to share before we wrap up this episode of the show? We just really appreciate being on the show with you, Amanda. I mean, um, you know, I just, we feel so passionate about what we're doing and what we're sharing um, with our clients and with our online clients and, and with the world. And, you know, it's, we appreciate you helping us, you know, get the messages out there to your audience and to those people who discover this. I mean, it just, it, it really means a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate your time as well. And can you share with listeners where they can go to find you, learn more about you and maybe, you know, start practicing with some of the tools and resources you have available? Yeah, they can head right over to resolvepainguru.com. 
And from there, they can access, get access to our, our Instagram and uh, YouTube and Facebook and also uh, our digital on-demand channel where they can start practicing right away. And there is free stuff there as well. Lots of free resources. Awesome. And then of course we have an upcoming, we've got an upcoming workshop. So that's coming up um, in, um, in a couple of months. So yeah. Amazing. I will put links to all of that in the show notes. Thank you both so much for your time, Carrie, Nicole. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. You take care. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Matcha Mornings. To find links mentioned in this episode, show notes, photos, and more, head on over to wanderbarn.com forward slash podcast slash matcha dash mornings. To be the first to know about brand new episodes of Matcha Mornings, subscribe on your podcast app. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, please leave a review or send me an email at wanderbarn at gmail.com with the subject line Matcha Mornings. To follow along with me, Amanda Kingsmith, you can find me on Instagram at Amanda Kingsmith to learn more about other fun projects I'm working on. To find more great podcasts like this one on topics such as travel, the business of yoga, cryptocurrency, and more, head on over to wanderbarn.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon.